Okay, so I just want to just give you a brief overview of how the panel uh, discussion will work. Each panelist will be given an opportunity to answer a question. After each panelist has spoken, uh, we will have 10 minutes of uh, question, question and answer period. Then the second question will be delivered and again we'll have an opportunity to answer questions from the panelists again. And then at the, at the end of the uh, discussions there will be an open uh, forum for uh, just casual questions or uh, more, more uh, information of uh, what they were discussing. Thank you. Susan Forbes, uh, Dr. Forbes is going to introduce the panel. On my right, we have Dr. Joey Lynn Wabi, who's with the, as a recognized by the creator, first through her Anishinaabe name. She's an assistant professor in the School of Indigenous Relations at Laurentian University and in Sudbury. And she's also the academic director of the Indigenous Initiative Program, um, which is a provincial organization focused on research evaluation and exchange with youth. She has worked with Indigenous youth throughout the social service agencies, grassroots in initiatives, and other volunteer work. Her current research includes indigenous rites of passage with indigenous women, land-based language and culture camps in Northwestern Quebec, and land-based learning for on-campus post-secondary uh, students. Dr. Wabi is also actively involved in the community of Sudbury through the Child and Family Center, Swakamuk Native Friendship Center, and, in, uh, and has given invited presentations to various groups and agencies. Bernie is an educational developer uh, with a specialization in indigenous learning. He's an active leader in the Métis community of Ontario since 2003, and we have community members from the Métis uh, community here as well today. Um, Bernie was also the founding vice president of the Métis Artist Collective in Toronto and founding president of the Oshawa and Durham Region Métis Council. As a digital content creator and communications tools provider, he has led numerous projects for Indigenous organizations such as those I've already mentioned. And, and also the in Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centres, the Barrieri Native Advisory Circle, the Inuktuk Healing Lodge, the Association of Native Development and the Performing and Visual Arts, among others. A graduate of Ontario College of Art, Bernie te currently teaches several courses acro uh, across the Advanced Film Production Department at our colleague Durham College in the School of Media and Art Design, where he is also both involved in developing course curriculum in digital photography and film. And he is an award-winning Métis Anishinaabe uh, documentary and commercial filmmaker, photographer, and art practitioner. To Bernie's right is Mitch Huguenin. He's an Indigenous pedagogy designer at the Centre for Teaching and Learning at Trent University. In his previous role at Trent, he served as a Transitions and Indigenous Mentorship Coordinator at the First People's House of Learning. Mitch is also a part-time faculty member at Durham College, where he designs courses that emphasize indigenous perspectives and ways of knowing. A central focus of his current work is to develop inclusive, value-based educational approaches that promote reconciliation. He has a diploma in fitness and health promotion from Durham College and a BA in, in history and bachelor of education from Trent University. Mitch helps introduce faculty to indigenous pedagogical approaches and advises in the development of best practices for integrating indigenous knowledge and perspectives into course design and instruction. And I'll have to say on a personal note, note Mitch and I have been talking a lot because I want him to come and help us do better. Uh, at the end, we have uh, Nancy harmer Strahl, who has been teaching history and indigenous studies for over 30 years as a secondary school teacher. For the last five years, Nancy was, on the, indig was the indigenous studies facilitator at Durham District School Board where she worked with educators and staff in leading various workshops on indigenizing the K-12 curriculum. This is done by ensuring indigenous knowledge was shared by various elders um, and local indigenous voices from the First Nations, Métis and Inuit community. The hallmark of her work included making sure indigenous knowledge keepers were involved in all writing projects and workshops. She has taught indigenous studies, French immersion and core history at Port Perry High School and is also an award-winning teacher recognized by the OHASTA, the Hong Kong Veterans Association, and the recipient of the Minister of Veterans Affairs Commendation for her work with veterans. She's received the 2008 Governor General Award for Excellence in Teaching Canadian History. She's been part of the 2013 CBC documentary, The Eighth Fire, and she's been a keynote speaker at UIT's Faculty of Education and has given workshops on school 
in education. Nancy, thank you for being here. And last but not least, Kat Krieger, who is a very interesting ringtone. It's a dog bark. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, Kat is an Indigenous elder, traditional teacher, and mentor. He is Cayuga, Turtle Clan of the Six Nation, Haudenosaunee, close? Haudenosaunee or people of the Longhouse. Kat has been working as a traditional teacher and healer for more than 20 years in the native and multicultural community in Canada, the US, England, Germany, Poland, and Wales. He was taught in the old way, working for many years with the guidance of an Anishinaabe elder and First Nations elders, and was taught to do traditional ceremonies, teaching circles, and one-to-one -one work, and to help people to walk in a good way through life. Elder Krieger was a recent recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work in community speaking to diversity, equity, respect for women, anti-racism, anti-oppression, and he is presently an elder with the University of Toronto. So my thanks for all of you being here. We'd like you to um, share with, you, uh, with the audience your experiences in terms of incorporating Indigenous pedagogy within the, the educational system. And even as Indigenous scholars, that uh, clearly was not an easy task to do. So. so I'd like each of you, in your own way, to speak to your experiences with incorporating Indigenous pedagogy in your practices. So um, who would like to start? So the work I'm doing for D uh, Durham College at the moment would probably sound a lot more familiar to most of you folks that are, are starting to understand uh, what Indigenizing uh, the classroom and decolonizing the system is all about. It's, uh, it's sort of a co more conventional approach, although it in involves um, the principles of the seven grandfather teaching. And uh, this is ongoing work. It's, uh, uh, it will be emerging in the, in the coming months or probably by next year. We'll, we'll have to finish them and test, test it out. Uh, and that is work that uh, I see on the ground that is really very, very satisfying and we're getting great response from. There's certainly uh, a strong reception uh, here at Durham College, and although I feel we're, you know, emerging in this, uh, in this area, there's certainly uh, a lot of good reason to feel positive about the future. But what I wanted to talk about um, more specifically in terms of something I've actually completed in this regard is a recent project um, uh, recently completed. I was uh, working with Ontario College of Art and Design University in uh, partnership with uh, the Royal Ontario Museum under the Ontario 150 uh, fund and uh, particularly uh, through the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at OCAD-U. And we uh, completed um, a project, it was a full academic year, uh, this project, uh, and it involved non-Indigenous and Indigenous students. And compared to what I just previously described and perhaps some of the other work that um, you know, we see moving these, these ideas forward in education. This was a jump right off the deep end. Uh, we completely, we had the very rare opportunity to completely immerse ourselves in indigenous thinking, methodologies, and activities throughout the whole project. And the essence of it was that we would go into the deep collection of the ROM and our students, I was uh, acting as a, a research assistant and the lead uh, lead research assistant and teaching assistant. Um, the contract changed halfway through as the academic year ensued. And uh, we oversaw uh, myself and the team under Bonnie Devine, uh, under, uh, undertook, I think there were nine originally, uh, there were nine projects where these students went into these deep collections of the um, indigenous artifacts, selected uh, something that resonated with them and were asked to activate it. And by that, or requicken it, was another uh, term that we used a lot. Uh, we had to take a good, deep look at what the institution of museums represented and how they were, I guess, uh, just their approach to acquisitions, to the idea of conservations. And, and a lot of the conventions that we think about when we think about uh, museums, um, the, um, uh, much to our, our surprise, maybe maybe not a surprise, um, created a, a lot of discussion and raised a lot of really important issues, like should these artifacts be preserved? In fact, many of those artifacts are not meant to be preserved. 
So I, I can't get too deep into the individual projects, but I would urge you to go and take a look at uh, this, um, this website when you can. We ended up with a, an online platform. It's called Uncover Recover. And, um, but in terms of uh, incorporating Indigenous pedagogy into the, the project itself, as I said, we took a complete dive. It was really very little convention in terms of what we might think of as a learning environment. Uh, implemented there. Certainly we had a lot of briefings and updates in a conventional classroom situation, but most of it was done in the field. We of course went to the ROM and spent a lot of time in the collections. Uh, we were each student uh, recorded or as I said did a treatment of these ar uh, artifacts and pictured them from the past and made that commentary and educate and helped to educate um, each other on the original intention of those artifacts, what it meant to have those artifacts uh, in the ROM today. But the really exciting part was imagining their futures. So that was sort of the arc of our, uh, of our um, activity, um, but it was done in a, a very hands-on experiential way. So it was uh, a very exciting uh, project to be involved with. It certainly, if you get a chance to take a look at it, you'll see uh, how it breaks from what we might consider conventional uh, teaching. And uh, I'm also proud to say that it won a Lieutenant Governor's Award for Historic uh, for Heritage, which was just announced last week. Um, so I want to introduce myself in, in my language first and foremost. So my name loosely translates to spring woman. So the way it was explained to me by the elder that, that had gifted me with that name um, was that it brings forth new life um, in the cold and like the dead of winter that it has the ability to bring, to bring out the, um, the, the buds and, and allow things to grow. Um, and I think that when I got the name, I, was, I wasn't too sure about it. I was like, okay, like I believe in it. Like, of course I'm going to accept it because it came from someone near and dear to me. Um, but I think um, it took a while to grow into is, is what, what I guess what had occurred. So um, I think there is a difference between indigenizing the academy, and I think I want to say that first, and decolonizing. Um, so I was just thinking when I was sitting here is that I, I, I decolonize at home and I indigenize at work, right? So, um, and I think that's really important to delineate because within the system that, um, you know, the educational system and the way that it's set up, it's very difficult to decolonize within a system that has colonized. So we need to, I think for myself, I need to, to remember that. Um, also, um, and then when I'm at home, I try and do the decolonizing uh, with, my, with my children. Um, having them participate in ceremonies, pulling them out of school to do their rites of passage, um, and, and reframing perspectives, right? And I think that that's part of those experiences with, with um, you know, Indigenous pedagogy. It's not solely for the school. It's a fancy word that we use, but really it's about learning and how, how are we teaching and how are, how are students and, or how are learners getting that information? Or as my dad used to say, um, you know, how, how am I going to learn you? Right? That was his thing, <laughs> right? So anytime I hear that, I'm just kind of giggling because my dad was, was amazing. And I think too, another piece too is when you're indigenizing, you know, we have to remember not to dilute um, our the original teachings, right? And have them have them change along the way. And I think that's one of the big things right now for myself is this idea that I yes, I want to share and I want to do all these wonderful wonderful things in my classes with students. Um, but I also need to, to keep in mind and be very respectful of those original teachings and where they come from and who they come from, right? So I think it's, it's coming from that, uh, that kind, kind place. And I try and do things with kindness and gentleness first and foremost. Um, but there are times when I do, I, I don't ask, I just do. And I do that at work. So for example, um, smudging in my office where I work, we can't smudge in our offices. Um, so I don't ask, I just do it. That ability to do that 
um, is, is, um, is important. Um, another thing too that we did at Laurentian where I work, um, which is on the Tikamishin and Ishtabek territory and Wanapate, um, is um, we had a teepee oven. Um, and it was interesting because a lot of the, the conversation was, why, are we, why do we have a teepee in um, Northern Ontario? When in that territory, it's, it, they're wigwams or lodges. Um, so what had happened was the wigwam had um, been, not the wigwam, sorry, the teepee blew down. So that was an opportunity for us to put up our own indigenous uh, built structure led by uh, an elder, uh, Art Gadigus from Atikamishing. Um, Julia Pegamagabo, also from Atikamishing. Um, and it was through the program that I work in, um, the Indigenous Student Affairs, and also uh, the School of Architecture. Um, so we all banded together um, and we put in a Laurentian University Research Fund and we have our wigwam and we do a lot of, a lot of our good work in, in the wigwam. So thank you very much. <laughs> So, so I work at Trent, uh, Trent University in the Centre for Teaching and Learning as the Indigenous Pedagogy Specialist. And this is a wonderful new role um, at Trent. Um, I've heard that this role is being uh, developed at many other institutions uh, uh, across Canada, which is fantastic. But it requires a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge that I'm still developing. I'm sure you can tell I'm a young fellow and uh, it requires a lot of patience uh, as was said before um, most of our post-secondary institutions are, are colonial institutions or at least I guess found, their foundations are built in um, in a colonial way um, so to decolonize that's a that's a really big undertaking and to indigenize that's also a really big undertaking um, and I think much the same as the word reconciliation. A lot of people like to s sort of throw these words around. Reconciliation, let's do that. But, but a lot of folks don't really know what that word means. I think same goes for indigenization. And what I've noticed, at least at Trent, um, this word indigenization, uh, it frightens people. It frightens some of our faculty who are a little bit um, apprehensive, uh, uh, a little bit resistant maybe. Um, and this is Trent University, uh, one of the, the forerunners in terms of integrating Indigenous knowledge. Um, and certainly we've got a, a phenomenal uh, faculty there, but there are still teachers who, um, who are nervous, who are um, frightened at this, this word, Indigenization, because they don't know what it means. I think a lot of folks think the word Indigenization means we're going to replace Western knowledge with Indigenous knowledge. And that's, that's not the case. Indigenization is all about braiding or weaving the two together. And I think that when teachers learn that, they go, oh, okay, great. How do I do that? Um, and then they come to me and I have to ask myself, okay, how do I do that? Um, and it's, it's challenging. Um, certainly it's, it's easier to do in certain subject areas. It's, it's really easy to, to, to sort of integrate indigenous knowledge in, in, a, in a history course, for example. But when you're approached by someone who is a, um, uh, a, forensic, uh, psych, a forensic psychology uh, instructor, like it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit. Um, but what I've been taught at least in terms of really indigenizing your, your teaching practice, um, it always goes back to the, to the spiritual component, right? Um, and, and that's another thing that I think frightens uh, teachers, non-Indigenous uh, teachers. So when I bring up, well, part of this is integrating that spiritual component, people get a little bit standoffish because it's like, Ugh, spiritual stuff, firstly, I'm a non-Indigenous person. Who am I to integrate your people's belief system? And, and I, I totally get that. Um, but I think what what I'm trying to convey to a lot of our faculty in terms of integrating that spiritual com component is allowing our students to reflect on their learning experience outside of just the cognitive development, but the, their development as a, as a person, their spiritual development, you could say, um, incorporating things like storytelling. Um, traditional stories and, and traditional knowledge really does make 
a lesson come to life and a really good example um I'd, I'd like to think it's a good example a really really basic one would be if you're working um with a science class for example and, and you're working with um students who are who are to learn about uh plant biology or uh, better yet agriculture uh, you could start that whole lesson uh, by telling a story, by sharing a traditional story, that of the three sisters, mm. um, and then perhaps weaving in the, uh, the teachings about companion planting, right? Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, really, really quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, um, <laughs> three sisters being uh, beans, corn, and squash planted together, which we do now is called companion planting, and it's a, it's a great um, agricultural, scientifically proven um, way to do uh, way to do agriculture. So, anyways, um, there are there are all sorts of different ways you can indigenize your uh, curriculum, whether that's science or history or or whatever that might be. Um, our role as indigenous pedagogy developers is is a challenging one, but I would encourage uh, everyone, especially those of you that are teachers, to seek us out. Um, I really want to encourage the folks at Trent to seek me out, uh, regardless of how frightened you might be. Come chat with me, and certainly at other institutions do the same. Um, this is really great work that we're doing, so it's, it's uh, all good stuff. I think I'm <laughs> over time now. <laughs> <laughs> A lot has been said. Um, I am non-Indigenous. But um, I think for me, the first thing I did was decolonize my thinking. And that took a lot of time because they didn't know what to do. So I look at, I thought, okay, what's the first step? The first step was respecting indigenous knowledge with the same respect that we respect European knowledge systems. Really look at it that way. And you know, for me in my classroom was opening up what I taught um, to the diversity of Indigenous knowledge. And what I really wanted to focus on was our local people, Indigenous people. <clears throat> the fact that we're, sit we're standing next to the Scugog Trail, 10,000 years old. Mm. You're, 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 it's right here. It's been used for 10,000 years, opening yourself up to what has happened, what is happening locally, and, and seeking out those opportunities to learn about it. And I'm reminded of Josephine Mandem and who's in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn about water. Yeah. I wanted to learn about water. What did it mean? So I don't know. I just, I went and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, I want to learn about the water. Okay. So I walked with them. I walked for weeks to learn about the water. And you know, what I, what I found was, you know, it was an, an opportunity for me to understand and, and, and by listening, by not talking, listening. And also the fact that when you walk from three o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon, you learn a lot about the land and you create a relationship with the water. And for me, I was opening up my, I was opening myself up to the diversity of knowledge. Um, and that's how you learn. That was indigenous pedagogy to me. Um, I attended as much as I could. Um, I also, um, you know, trying to change my language. My language is really important. Uh, decolonizing my thinking, it kind of seems obvious, but you know, you know, legends and myths, you know, okay, we're gonna get a, do away with those stereotypes to unveil the real truth and the perspectives. Um, and Relationship building is dispelling those legends, those myth legends and stereotypes that will hinder your deeper learning. Now, I worked at the Durham District School Board and um, I tried to really, uh, certainly at Port Perry High School, uh, the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation were right next door. I taught their kids and I, and I, I could see in their eyes that they were not you know, the, nothing was really being reflected back to them. And I thought, well, that's wrong. It's just plain wrong. I'm teaching history. What is the history of this area? Who are the people? And how do you do that? Well, you go and you meet the people. And we'll talk about that later. But I, you know, things like um, 
teaching in a circle. Okay, really hard, not easy. I had to work through that really hard. But what I ended up seeing was that my students were changing and that's using the pedagogy and everyone benefited. Um, experiential learning, getting outside. We did on, land, on the land teachings. Um, we would go out um, to our local, I guess, uh, non-quan. We would go out <laughs> with a biologist and an indigenous plant um, expert, and we did two-eyed scene. Um, and I guess the, the, the thing that's most important in indigenous pedagogy is connecting your head to your heart to create deeper learning. And um, you have to open a different pathway to learning. And I call it heart work. <laughs> because um, you, know, you can learn about residential school in a book you know, or a lecture. And I would give my students a day to, to let it sink in. And then we would work on, and then we would meet someone who had been a survivor. And you know, that's when the kids internalize their learning. It went from here to here. And from there, and that's what I'm hearing, you're acting on it. Um, and so then you can continue your research and um, connect with community members. Sego Tansi, when we draw from the Bishkad and Dushni Kaj, Jikan Dodam, Brampton and Dushni Kaj. I live in Brampton. I live away from the big water. And the reason I say that is because all my life I've lived near the big water. And there is a connection with our people to the land that sometimes even some of ourselves don't recognize it until that's taken away. And when we lose something, then we, we for anyone here, you lose something, you really think, well, I miss that now. And it was actually uh, Cheryl, my partner, and I were talking to my auntie. And she asked me, where do you live now? I said, Brampton. She said, oh, you live away from the water. You've never lived away from the water in your whole life. It made me think backwards through my life that yes, she was right. I've never been away from that contact with the big water. And why am I including that? Because there is uh, an indigenous point of view as each and every one of us has a point of view about how to look at something. Whether we call that a, a way of visioning things, a way of looking at stuff, a way of understanding. And it's important how it's delivered to us. What is the pedagogy that's being used? So I know uh, you read my bio, thank you. Uh, reminded me I need to update it because that about, <laughs> that's about 10 years out of date. Um, so I am working at the University of Toronto now. So although I was for a number of years there, even my USW thing said Indigenous Elder. Um, and I might have been the first USW hired Indigenous Elder. Uh, the rest were brought in under like a contract. But they changed that recently, gave me a, a new name for my door, my office. And it says Indigenous Advisor. So I'm to advise, I don't know if I'm supposed to, actually I shouldn't say that. Um, whether I'm supposed to advise indigenous people <laughs> or be someone who advises about indigeneity. And I think it's, it's both because our, our youth coming to post-secondary have gone through the system that we were discussing a little bit and are suddenly landing in an institute of higher education, often missing what it was that identifies who they are. And it's not visible sometimes, not existent. And there's some, I have some awesome examples. I was making notes, you know, right after saying, I don't make notes. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this system of, of um, indigenizing or decolonizing or all those, those, those components, and far be it for me to take it on myself to completely change a system because the people that came here brought the system with them that they understand. And being part German English, I didn't say that in words. I, I said my spirit name, Makwa Gishka which is, and, and I had trouble growing into my spirit. And it really confused me at first. In fact, I had to ask, because my elder just uh, said, well, it's, it's day bear. I didn't know if he meant like no clothes in the daytime <laughs> <laughs> or a big bear outside. And, and it turned out to be, as he described the vision, a bear standing in a meadow in the sunshine, standing upright, wearing a medicine bag and uh, uh, absorbing that sun, feeling what it's like. And I know when we tilt our face up, that's a really good feeling. That's the feeling I like all of our students, all of our people uh, to feel when they come into a post-secondary education. Like you're coming into somewhere where something's striking you that you just want more of. Mm -hmm. And it's so comfortable and safe. And there's an important part I think we're all touching on is how safe do we feel? Does it feel like we're supposed to be here? And that's a big toss-in. When we're dealing with how do we teach this, 
Um, so I, yes, I advise people. I work on curriculum. Uh, I do ceremonies. You know, I, I try to initiate things in a, in a system that has trouble right away grasping how is it that that's important. So I try to go backwards and try to so show why is this important to us. And we talk about myths and legends and changing that point of view. We don't have myths and legends, uh, including when people were walking here 10,000 years ago, the Skugog, we carry a system of concepts, ideals, and philosophies that are as ancient as the Greeks, as, as Kant, as Plato, as, as the symposium, all those things, all those things. And that with anything you have, you know, part of the culture says, when I have something useful to people, I would like to share it. All heads the same height. And when we do that smudge, and thank you, I needed that. When we do that smudge, that saying, what I, what, I, what I speak and what I listen to, I want to go through my heart. Because that's really where I store things. And if I store something there, this part of my head has no problem accessing that information. I just put it up here. I have a great deal of trouble um, bringing it back up. And that the, it's difficult as, as faculty, as people coming forward, and we'll, we will talk about this later. And I think if I translate that into that, how do we learn about this? What is it you can tell us? There's almost an onus on us to be there to say, okay, this is how you do it. And I, I always translate that into my dad's old concept about hunting. And the idea that I've yet to have, you know, pull up to the hunting area, open my trunk, and I've never had the deer run up and jump in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go hunt it. And this, this whole idea why we're here, why we have students here, maybe a, a mindset to look at these things in is we're here to hunt. So our students, our faculty, we're still hunting. We need to provide for ourselves. We need to shelter ourselves. You know, the teepee blew over, so there's a wigwamas there. That's cool, too. I know how to put up a TP, but it's not part of my culture. The, the idea that we need to, to build a metaphorical structure, as well as a physical structure, as well as a heartfelt structure for people to learn both ways. Because sharing isn't just somebody giving something, it's receiving something as well. And as soon as we make a circle out of that. So when I teach in class, uh, and, and another thing that's beautiful, and I'll go into it more later, is co-teaching. Mm -hmm. indigenous with uh, a prop so they actually made me a sessional instructor based simply on my background because I have no degree I went to I went to high school in the 70s I can't remember if I graduated <laughs> <laughs> the this whole idea of um, moving forward in these things and like I said I was making notes but it was every time I made a note it was brought up and I realized we all have a similar mindset when we speak about these things, about having a, um, the idea of we have a multi, um, we are multi faculty. So a lot of indigenous people or ones when we come to this, we, we talk art, we talk spirituality, we talk um, traditional ecological uh, knowledge, oh, red card, <laughs> the sciences. <laughs> um, and how can we blend those, how can we braid those together? Mind, body, spirit, we need to braid those together. And the red card scares me because I've I used to do competitive fencing. If one of the judges pulls up a red card, that means you put down your weapon and back away and you're in trouble. Miigwech for listening to me. So, th thank you. That's uh, wonderful introductions. And um, we are trying to slowly work our way towards developing a, a minor in Indigenous Studies. Right. Um, not 100% sure that's what it would be called, but I was just wondering if we could, if I could bounce that off of you, and if you had to think about what you would want a university student to focus on in the process of acquiring knowledge, and uh, keep in mind it's a minor, so we can't do everything. We have to be fairly, you know, choosy, right? And we want to make the right choices, and uh, so I. I um, appreciate uh, any advice you'd have on that. So I'll just I'll be really brief in just saying that I think for uh, for our students, a lot of them are getting um, sort of a, a tip of the iceberg introduction to Indigenous peoples of Canada, right? And I think that oftentimes um, we dive right into the colonization piece. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the way to do it because it's often like, oh, colonization is your history, but it's, it's really not. Colonization interrupted our history. So, so it's important to, to talk about that, um, but certainly to also 
talk about um, who we were for thousands of years prior to that period and who we are and who we're going to be. Um, and I think, uh, I think certainly for, for our uh, students, the vast majority, um, they've, they've not learned about this before. Um, for our Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, this can be a, a challenging learning experience. Um, I've worked with Indigenous students before coming to, to Trent uh, to learn about their history, and this is a story that they've never heard before. And, and that can be really, really um, tricky for a non-Indigenous uh, teacher to navigate, um, especially when navigating also conversations had between non-Indigenous students and Indigenous students and why are we learning this and those, those challenging questions that are raised. Um, I, don't, I don't have like answers necessarily, but I just wanted to bring those, those uh, pieces up. Um, we, we can, you and I can certainly talk more. Trent is, uh, Trent is sort of ahead of the game, I think, in a lot of ways, but I'll pass the microphone on to my, my colleagues here. Um, so I just want to say, like, I may go a little bit anti here. So um, the idea that, so I'm just going to, I'll tell you a story about uh, one of my colleagues who was asked by the president of the university at the time, he's not there any longer, the president, and to have a coffee, and they were talking about something, you know, and he was like, oh, well, tell me a little bit more about that, you know. And just asking questions, she thought it was a coffee. Um, her words went into a report and it was called consultation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I just want to be very mindful that even though like, I'm very hesitant to give specific answers for specific programs for specific things, because I think it, 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 it um, because of the diversity of the nations, right? So what works for Algonquin people uh, may not work for Haudenosaunee, may not work for uh, people in BC, um, you know, so I just want, wanted to, to bring that. And that's why I said I might go a little bit anti because my aunties do that to me all the time. <laughs> 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 me in my place. <laughs> so miigwech. I was, you know, I was thinking about Dr. Marie Batiste when she said nothing about us without us. I always think about that. Um, in that's why in, uh, you have to involve the community in planning and implementation. Uh, you work together. If you work together, you can achieve it. And I like that, what you're doing. That's exactly the way to do it. We work together. Um, and I think that, you know, I have a best practice here, you know, creating great spaces for Indigenous cultural practices is really important. Um, understanding the knowledge of the land and you know getting to know what that land acknowledgement really means spend time learn about it when you say it you know what it means learn about the people um, and, and again um, locally when, it, when what we were doing at uh, Durham was we were providing education to all staff faculty upper administration secretarial custodial student you know everybody was was included in this um, and also the fact that, in, you know, creating policy that is informed by what you want to achieve and be accountable to measurable outcomes. And I always think of the uh, 1764 Treaty of Niagara, we need to polish that silver chain or it will tarnish. So you bring it back up every year and polish that chain. Thank you. I'm fairly new at uh, educational development. But, uh, and I've been thrown in the deep end, I'd have to say. And I feel like when I hear a question like that, I think you want something to take away. And um, we've heard some amazing uh, suggestions here already. I think uh, teaming up is a great thing because ultimately this idea of indigenizing, as Mitch pointed out, is really about sharing. So we really have to find the common ground. There's, you know, there's a lot to be recognized. Um, so, in, in practical terms, as we build these systems and these ways of uh, integration, uh, you know, I'm sure many teachers, like myself in my regular teaching role, um, wonder what can I do now and, and start to head on the right path. And certainly those acknowledgements of the land, uh, the local area, 
bringing relevancy into it, certainly consciously letting folks know this is where we're going, like bringing that conversation up, but also, you know, uh, taking that on yourself. I, I know uh, Mitch and I were talking before the uh, we started, and I, I think probably by our very nature, we've indigenized our classroom environments by the way we deliver. So if you look uh, at principles like reciprocity, you know, um, I really need to get to know my students to really teach them. And I have to allow them to know me within appropriate, you know, standards. So those, that's been a very, very powerful uh, thing in my class and it hasn't changed the system one bit. That's just the way I deliver. And the response has been fantastic. So we need to all individually take on whatever uh, degree of responsibility we can, I feel, to learn and transform ourselves, maybe deprogram that colonial, you know, uh, kind of mindset and, and uh, move forward with kindness and respect and those uh, principles that, you know, keep ourselves open and open up those that are listening. Also, there was something else that was said earlier that I think is vitally important is the sense of safety in the room. Um, this is really important, for, especially for Indigenous students, to feel safe and, you know, in a safe space. So beyond that, I mean, uh, centering traditional knowledge, uh, bringing uh, Indigenous scholars into your, uh, into your syllabus, this is really important. These are, th there's a vast amount of uh, information there. I mean, we, I'm sure between the folks up here, we'd have one heck of a reading list. We put a book list together. <laughs> I'd love to share that. I think that's a great, uh, a great start. So it really starts with us and the way our attitude and our delivery may change in the classroom. That's I mean. I talked a little bit about co-teaching. And one of the things that, the reason that came about was I have a policy with my office, which is also the Indigenous Center, which I, um, the entirety of that at my campus. Um, and I made it really clear to faculty, staff, students, whoever, and community also. That my door was open, you were welcome to walk in. So it was open to everyone. And it's interesting when, it, when I hear everybody needs to learn, that's really important. So the, the people that clean my office at night, mm -hmm. they have a really good idea of what to dust, what not to dust. I'll move stuff out of the way. They'll show up for circles sometimes. I know what's happening with, with the, the, the Polish woman that always comes and, and does the stuff so nicely with her daughter, how she's feeling, um, right up to the uh, principal himself with his interest in astrophotography. And that building relationship thing is a critical component. And there's something I've noticed a while, and I've talked about a lot at the, at the university, how it makes it difficult for us, you, as knowledge keepers with the old idea that there was a time, and uh, Cheryl and I this morning were working with the Punjab community seniors. There was a time when the seniors, the knowledge keepers, the wisdom keepers, the teachers, the professors, were looked at with great respect. I like to think that anyway. And that that person standing there at the front of the room had devoted their life to sharing knowledge with you. With, and that's, that seems to have changed. Did anybody notice that with students sometimes? There's, there's a change where, um, that respect sometimes isn't quite there. And sometimes it's because what is it I'm being taught? Who is teaching me? Do I have a relationship with that person? So I, I don't mean there's a lack of respect, don't, don't get me wrong, but it's hard to understand or really take to heart what somebody's saying if you have no relationship with them. Having said that, some of our classes are 400 students. It's really difficult. That's a lot of sage <laughs> to try and smudge with. Yet when I teach a class, the first thing that happens, if I can't smudge in the classroom, we go outdoors. And one of the classes I did recently was, oh, okay, people are from all over the world. And I use this as an example. We're going outside to smudge. What is smudge? We learn about smudge. We have a few classes. There's a teaching right after that in the classroom. There's a little sharing section. That only takes about 15, 20 minutes. I know it sounds like a lot, but the bonding within this classroom, and then we go into subject matter. And that's driven by curiosity of the students. What is it you don't know about this? I don't want to repeat what you already know, but what don't you know? The faculty member beside me who is non-Indigenous, now it's become a mentor-mentor relationship, and we're learning from each other. 
because it's pretty hard if somebody, if you're into, I don't know, astrophysics and somebody goes, you have to add indigeneity to this, you're like, I don't know that subject. <laughs> or if you're teaching math and somebody says you need to teach, uh, I don't know, culinary activities or, or it, it's scary as a faculty person to suddenly have this dropped on you when you don't know exactly what it is. So this idea of building a relationship is super critical. And it can't be with just one of us. There's a whole bunch of us, and you said it really well, that from different places comes different mindsets, comes different protocol, et cetera. And that's a whole lot to try and learn. So you know, part of what we're trying to do, I think, as, 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 as people, is there's a beautiful institution that teaches. We have a whole lot to contribute to that. And I think as somebody that's interested in something, pick your own hobby, something you love doing. If somebody walks in the room and goes, hey, I know about that too, I can add this and this and this and this and this, you go awesome and you build a relationship. So a lot of times the connectivity and where it comes from is, is critical. It's been brought up already that there's not gonna be any quick fixes, but certainly <laughs> a start, if, one, if we can have a couple of starting points. I have a mic, so I'll be really brief. <laughs> and that is really simple, is what lens are you looking through? And it doesn't start with who can come to you and teach you what, it is how you are looking at things. And what is, if you need Excel spreadsheets, why do you need that? Why do you need a rubric? Why do you need a learning outcome? And what is it, and what is, uh, how are you looking and through what lens? Are you looking at a different concept, a different pedagogy, a different culture? Which requires a commitment on some cases, you need to also educate yourself first before walking into the room to teach. Any subject we teach, we educate ourselves first, walk in, we know this, they're educated. So th there is a self-reflection component. So why do I look at things this way? What is there that I can change to accommodate or walk in? If I go to hunt, I wear camouflage. If I go something like this, I wear a jacket. So we sometimes have to change ourselves a little bit or add on, sorry, mm -hmm. add to ourselves. I started that journey. I was oh. you. A, a while, you know, and what I had to do is I had no awareness of uh, the community. And, you know, I could say our institution had no awareness. And so, you know, you, you question what to do, what to, how do you proceed? And um, what I've learned is that you have to walk the talk. You have to seek it out. And um, if you're invited, you go. There are 12,000 Indigenous people that live in Durham. There are many opportunities to learn, but you have to go and learn from, from the people. And then if there's, there are questions, then the best thing I've ever, ever had was a cell phone. I, <laughs> I make those connections and pick up the phone and then ask and then proceed from there. And it's, it'll take years, but in the end, it'll, it'll be so much better for you, but don't expect to do it all in one, you know, one year. Mm -hmm. Take time, it's worth it. In terms of, of going forward, what do you think the one or two most important things are with respect to making connections and building relationships with our Indigenous and First Nations communities, and especially in our area? Okay, so for myself, uh, I guess a key takeaway is it takes time. You need to have that time um, to spend, to do things, and pushing past the boundaries of the institution um, and foregoing them and just surpass them. And you need to go to community. You need to sit down by the fire. You need to talk to the aunties, the uncles, the, uh, the Kokums, um, the grandpas, all of those. You, you need to go out there and you need to be visible because if you're not visible, you're no, you're not that you're nobody. But they don't <laughs> know who you are, right? So, and I am defined by not my title as a doctor or as academic director or professor. I'm defined by who my parents are and where my lineage comes from. So I think that's also important. And as, um, as Nancy had said on the end, walk your talk. And my, the students that I teach in the classes that I have, um, they'll know that that's what I say all the time. You need to walk your talk because if you don't, then you're 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 um, you're not seen as um, as a you know responsible person in society or in in the society that we live in because you can't be dependent on. Uh, so those would be my key takeaways: is uh, spending time and walking the talk. Thank you, Joey. It is. It's about uh, our changing ourselves. I agree hundred percent with that. But um, I'm thinking about you know 
tools and mechanisms and things that you want to activate and connect. I mean, learning outcomes and, and high, uh, you know, uh, high watermarks or, or those, those, uh, those uh, benchmarks, it's, you know, you can set them, but set them really for yourself. And uh, I think it's hard to, to get your mind around abandoning, you know, this rigid or, you know, well-established structure that we've all worked in. It almost seems like, wow, we can't do that. But in many ways, I think we have to. You also have to look at, so, you know, you really, um, and I've heard this time and time again. Last, let me back up a little bit. Last week, I went to the TRC educational conference down at Six Nations, and three years out from the call to actions, there's still very little work done. In fact, I thought, well, it's a lot of work, but you know, by those standards that you speak of, that might not seem like so much. Uh, but there are a couple of things I just wanted to say. One is that in this day and age, technology is now becoming an amazing tool. It was only t you know, 20 years ago at the uh, MNO AGA, I was the only one with a camera there and I was watched very carefully and it was very, very rigid what I could and couldn't shoot and so on. And that has changed a lot. There still needs to be a lot of respect, but certainly new media, of course this is an area, contemporary art really approaches a lot of these difficult subjects in a way that's extremely accessible to a lot of people. And um, I think you should, it's always good uh, to use those tools where, where possible. Um, uh, but it's really the measurements become more personal and, you know, it's about, you know, opening up yourself to that. And that's where the, the real deep change and progress, I think, will come. Yeah. So I guess a, a quick takeaway, um, and one that kind of occurred to me here, you know, we're all in the business of, uh, of educating and learning. And at the other, at my campus one day, somebody told me, this is a place of teaching. And I thought, then I disagreed. I said, no, this is a place of learning. Nobody in this institution is exempt from that. There is at no point do we stop learning. And if there's a new thing, a new subject, a new part of what we can do and learn about, and it helps us present, teach, learn, or understand better, then we have a responsibility to pick that up. And I like that. I can remember my father telling me, never stop exploring. Never stop exploring. In fact, my son used to have this big thing in his room that was across the wall that said, never stop exploring. It was actually a North Face ad. <laughs> we stole it, but <laughs> it meant so much. And if you, know, if, you wanna, if you wanna move ahead, if there's anything, if you realize as a member of the faculty or as a student, it doesn't end at the end of the class. It doesn't end when you get your doctorship. That's just the start. And I figure as long as I'm on two legs and, and can do something, you know, no matter what happens to me, I can continue to learn. So there's that requirement to recognize we are in a place of learning. None of us are exempt. One thing I've noticed anecdotally from my students, and we start talk, talk about, uh, and we use the, the, the uh, terminology that you're hearing today, it, it can shut things down. The good news is that in current events. I mean, there's something unfolding every day relevant to our everyday life that we hear that will be a great entree into this subject and will give you a way of approaching and talking about all these principles and you don't have to look back through history. I mean, we all have a lot to learn about history perhaps, but um, to activate minds, young minds that are easily drifting off, I mean, uh, there's something in the news, and I, and I bring the world to my classroom every day and explore a lot of the themes we're talking about in the context of very contemporary issues, and I find that really um, well received. I guess for me it's be fearless and challenge yourself to see the truth about Turtle Island, the people that live here, and know that this is laden with mistakes, and what I like to do is do-overs. If you don't get it right the first time, try again and never give up. We put our students in uncomfortable situations every single day. We, they make mistakes, but what, are we, what do we do as educators? We lead them towards the truth on how to do this properly, and I think this is, we just use those fundamental teachings. You're going to make mistakes. Plan for it. Mm. Um, so I have a, a background in fitness and health and 
So I'm used to hearing people uh, say, I'd like a quick fix, like I want to lose weight really quickly, or <laughs> I like the new fad Do diets and whatnot. <laughs> Pardon me? Do you give tips? Uh, well, well, here's the thing, right? So it's, it's similar to this reconciliation piece. It's similar to this indigenization piece. It's similar to building relationships. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no quick fix, and teachers hate to hear that because they want to come to us and say, listen, I'd like to do this. How do I do it quickly so I can so I can do it tomorrow. And it's like, well, it doesn't really happen overnight. You have to build relationships, and these relationships have to, they have to be authentic. And it's not just about um, revising your teaching practice. Um, it's not just about thinking in that, that professional box. It's, it's a lifestyle change. That's what I tell people in the fitness industry, right? It's a lifestyle change. But in terms of indigenization and working with indigenous peoples and connecting with communities, building relationships, like that's a, that's a lifestyle change. That's a, um, that's a lifelong pursuit. Mm -hmm. you're, you're building relationships. It's not something that you can do overnight. Um, when those relationships become meaningful, uh, that's when your teaching practice starts to change in a meaningful way. Um, so that's, that's my two cents um, in regards to, to building community relationships. But the other part that I wanted to mention um, is, is, is don't rely on your students either. Um, a lot of us will rely on, on our community relationships and others will rely on our indigenous students in the classroom as, as the expert voice or the authentic voice. Um, certainly uh, uh, invite your students, all, your stu all of your students to participate in discussion, but don't rely on your indigenous students to be the experts. That's a big responsibility mm. to place on a, on a young person, uh, especially when they might just be learning this material for the first time. And they're navigating that uh, uh, journey um, and taking time on that journey. So um, that's another uh, piece to bear in mind. But in, in all regards, uh, uh, being transparent and respectful and also being patient too. Um, patient with yourself and patient with, with the people you're working with. When you're reaching out to, to community members, organizations, individuals, know that there are fewer of us than there are of most other folks out there and we're getting pulled in a lot of different directions. So if we don't respond to an email right away, just be patient or, or try again, right? Keep trying. Um, we're, we're busy people, <laughs> right? Um, so patience is, is good to bear in mind. Yeah, miigwech. All right, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, how can we develop uh, uncolonized minds within a colonial institute like uh, the universities? Um, clearly, like the, being a product of that, I've experienced it throughout education. How do I develop uh, my own perspective on uh, a colonial teachings with an indigenous perspective, whereas um, we are applying indigenous perspective to the colonial system. I'm not sure if I uh, made sense, but yeah. Oh, me? <laughs> really? Oh, Making boy. Sure. Okay. Make it a work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, three sets of this for five reps each. No. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> almost, though, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, cause for a lot of us, I think uh, we uh, we tackle that colonial structure ourselves, and sometimes I think it was said early on that we, we kind of have to break the rules and be a, a rascal sometimes, right? Um, and that's 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 on us as as educators and for students like yourself. I'd imagine you're a student. Um, it, it can be tricky because. In one class, you might learn a very Western approach to this, and in another class, you might learn through the indigenous perspective or through the indigenous lens. Um, <laughs> and it can, it, bless you, and it can sometimes be uh, challenging to balance the two. Um, but at Trent, we have the motto, challenge the way you think. Um, and I encourage my students, I say, don't be sheep. Always, uh, always think for yourself. Don't follow the group. So I guess, just to keep it short, that's, that's my advice, is to take a step back from what you're learning and really just reflect on the learning experience you're having. Um, it's never to say that the, 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 the Western knowledge being shared with you is incorrect. It's just one way to engage with, with the universe and certainly the, the other uh, way of, ways of 
engaging with the universe are just as valid and just as valuable, but to really take a step back and, and reflect on, on that learning experience. So I just want to say Jimmy Gritch for even having the courage to say that because I think that's amazing. And I don't have any words of wisdom other than I'm just to encourage you to keep thinking the same way and, and to keep learning in uh, new ways. And I, I think it's mm -hmm. phenomenal. And one of the seven grandfather teachings, which is my favorite, is humility. It's this idea that I don't know and I don't know what I don't know, right? And it's okay not to know those things. Mm -hmm. But you have that curiosity and that, that want to get out there and, and want to know those things. And so I, you know, I think it's amazing. So change work. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to seize the moment to say Miigwech as well, because that's one of those questions where we all, all sit back and go, oh boy. <laughs> but the, it was said earlier, the, just the idea of indigenizing, I think has been misunderstood in a lot of ways. It is a common experience that we're going to go through. It's a common responsibility. It's not uh, to make the curriculum, you know, Indigenous is like in that sense. Indigenous is of the land and we are all of the land. So um, I have a quote I wanted to read because I think it really addresses this. George Erasmus was the chief of the Assembly of First Nations back in 91 when we had the Royal Commission on uh, Aboriginal Peoples. And I think he got it right. Where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must be created. Well, I think that's a, a very profound thought in that it takes a long time to create that common memory and that is part of what we're trying to do right now, I think. Finally, <laughs> thank you. There, there, there's a component of this that's a bit difficult. So as a young child, one of the first places I lived, or second places I lived, was Germany. So I moved over there in 1960. We lived in Berlin. Uh, there was a lot of construction happening in 1960 in Berlin. Does anybody know what they were building? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, they were a bit hyper. Um, however, being an indigenous person was like awesome. You know, there was like this deep respect. Oh my, you're indigenous, that's amazing. And um, I moved from there in 1965 to the middle of Manitoba near Brandon, and had no clue what was coming in because we were not taught about indigenous culture. We were not taught about oh, uh, the residential schools, et cetera. And I can remember my first teacher in, in, in Brandon, Manitoba going, what are you doing here? You should be in residential school. And I'm like, wow, we get our own school? <laughs> Literally, and then found out very quickly, and I did not go to residential school, but I found out very quickly what it meant to be, to face racism, oppression, uh, bigotry, etc. And then, so what I'm saying, I guess, is in the academic system, in the school system that was present, prevalent then, I was not taught my history either. So being in a, in a military family, we were all over the planet, and I missed that, what was happening here at home. And I learned very quickly, as I started to live in Manitoba, what that was all about. So there's uh, a component missing to the education system. And like any product you're presented with, if I go buy something, I want it to be a complete product. And if the people selling that product are not aware that there's something missing, they're not to blame. Mm -hmm. So we have to add more to the product that we're selling. Mm -hmm. And I think adding to that product, there is a responsibility not only for the institution, but for the individual to say, I am interested in this. I want to know about that. In fact, until you know what you want to know, you don't even bother to come to university. Well, unless your parents tell you to be a lawyer. <laughs> Sorry, faculty of law, if we're here. Um, so we come with preconceived notions of what should be there for us, and yet it is a huge thing to educate. It is a massive subject to cover everything. And you know, I hear so much about blaming sometimes that the people in the institution are not always to blame. They're trying to educate. They, their passion is to teach people. Their commitment is to the, to the idea of developing knowledge and wisdom among our youth. So we're adding another thing in, and there is very few of us. There is not a lot of us, so. Um, bear with us and we'll try to do the best we can. It's like, you think classes are big? <laughs> We're trying to do a whole nation in one sitting. And, and what I've learned, I think as well, to answer your question, is, is to go to the communities to learn. But the first thing I really 
highly recommend is that you learn the protocols. That's really important. Learn how to be in Indigenous spaces. Um, you know, I love what you did today. An opening is an opening, and it was perfectly done today. I was just really impressed. Um, and I had to learn the hard way because I remember doing something and we started backwards and I was really lucky that the, uh, the elder liked me and she went, why are you doing that? Why do you people always do that? I'm like, what, what? I didn't know, but then I never did it again, right? So you learn by your mistakes. Um, and learning how to enter Indigenous spaces. What I see a lot are people that want to come to learn. There's a circle, what do I do? They go into the circle, you need to, to learn, watch. Um, I see a lot of people going to the outside, pulling the chair out and going in. I had to learn, right? It's true, you have to enter in the circle, depending on what territory you're on. If you're in Haudenosaunee territory, you go the other way. If you're in Anishinaabe territory, well, <laughs> we're in Anishinaabe territory, so we go this way, clockwise and counterclockwise and figure out where to sit. That was the biggest thing for me, was to figure out where to sit. Don't sit next to the elder, because you are the first person to speak. <laughs> so <laughs> sit on the other side, and then just follow what is happening, because everywhere you go is different. The other thing, um, you know, uh, and if you don't know, ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just ask the person who's conducting what to do. Um, also, you know, learning how to offer tobacco. You gave a perfect example of how to do that because it's not a thank you to be given at the end. You're asking a person to share. You're, this is the purpose of asking, sharing your knowledge. When I hold the tobacco, it's pretty sweaty by the time I'm done, but it certainly helps me. Yeah, and in the left hand, exactly. And um, the most important thing was learning how to listen. That was really hard. You have to be present, no phones, no, you know, nothing to distract you. Keep your, keep your focus and listen. And if you didn't learn the first time, go again. They say sometimes it takes four times before you actually really learn it. And um, my greatest uh, compliment was one day when somebody said to me, hey, Nancy, you know white people talk too much. And I said, yeah, 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 I've been told. He said, you don't talk as much. Thank you. <laughs> I'll add a tiny bit. So when I was much younger, I was taught um, some of the concepts of the old sand teachings where there was symbols drawn in those sands. So one of my first ways of learning that was the elder would give me a bucket of sand, tell me to make a rectangle and make it perfectly level, just using my hands. I would do that. We would do the sand teaching. And I was, oh, that's cool. I, I, I got it. He goes, no, no. When, you, when we're done that sand teaching, imagine that that, that three feet by two feet, however big it is, that each time you hear it, you retain one grain of sand. Mm -hmm. And that each time you hear it, you get another grain of sand. And how long it would take to learn that whole thing. And that's a, that's a difficult task, mm -hmm. but you, you start somewhere. I will step in here for a moment. I learned a lot. Thank you. Sorry. I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would like to ask Jill to come up and give closing remarks. So I just want to uh, say miigwech, chi miigwech to um, our wonderful panel here. Um, I think we all learned a lot. I did. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, so there are many thank yous to say, and I hope I don't forget anyone. But um, again, chi miigwech to our wonderful panelists. Thank you to our president, Dr. Stephen Murphy, for his welcoming remarks. Mm. Uh, miigwech to our collaborators. This was a joint event with the Indigenous Education and Cultural Services, that's us, <laughs> um, the Teaching and Learning Centre, and special thanks to Dr. Susan Forbes, who is a wonderful ally, um, and the President's Indigenous Reconciliation Task Force. <laughs> There's all those words right in one Ooh. title. <laughs> um, anyway, um, in particular, Dr. Rachel Aris for helping us with this event as well, who is also a wonderful ally. The Student Life Planning and Communications team. I don't know if you're, anybody's here from there, but you did awesome work, thank you. Um, UIT Communications and Marketing team. 
our amazing caterer, Tamara Green. Um, and she's a graduate of the Durham College um, Culinary Arts Program. And what did she say? Baking. Baking, too. Baking. Something about yeah, baking. Certificate in baking. Yeah. Um, my outstanding co worker, Carol Ducharme. Um, yes, yes. She did. she did so much work on this. Um, Rick, for doing the smudge and opening. Mm. And of course, all of you for being here. So, Chimigwech. Oh. Keep in mind what each of us have repeatedly offered. Just reach out to us. Each and every one of us has said that. Um, the deer is not going to jump in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if you're vegetarian. <laughs> 